because it's not just a monastery even for women, although it is, you know, set up to offer the full training towards full ordination for women, but it's a place where everyone can come of any gender, nationality, race, colour, sexuality, it doesn't matter, you know, the place is a place for all, and I think it's so important to have places that we can practice together, you know, other than the Zoom <laughs> medium, which is wonderful, but, uh, you know, there's nothing that really beats getting together as supportive friends on the path, and having that long-term relationship, which I think, you know, you can have in a place like Guy House when you come regularly and you maybe sit with various teachers frequently, you get to know them over time, but oftentimes if you're only doing the odd retreat here or there, you don't really have that opportunity to be part of each other's life. And I think a monastery enables us to be like actually creating something together as part of each other's life. So it's a very special thing and it will happen and it is happening and this is all part of it. So I'm very glad to be here today with everybody. And uh, yeah, it's a nice small group today. I'm used to teaching probably slightly bigger groups, but it makes me feel that we can really relax and... Um, I don't know, have a little bit of more intimacy. So, as I understand it, these sessions normally start with about 20 minutes or so of a reflection on a particular theme, followed by about half an hour of meditation, which I will guide in the beginning and then let you go your way with. And then we will open for some question and answers. And all of you are able to unmute yourselves so you'll just basically just shout it out or <laughs> however you want to come in, you know, you're welcome to. So you don't need to put your hands up or anything like that. It'll be quite spontaneous and, and quite intimate, as I said. So the theme that I wanted to uh, introduce and speak a little bit to today is the theme of mudita, which is otherwise known as uh, altruistic sympathetic, rejoicing joy, that's my favourite word for it, um, and it's one of the Brahma Viharas, it's one of the sublime abidings or divine abidings that the Buddha talked about as a beautiful resting place for our mind. And um, the mudita comes after metta and karuna, and the Buddha said it's one of the hardest, or it's seen to be one of the hardest to develop, probably because it needs to go in a certain sequence. And yet, at the same time, it's one that's most productive of a lot of joy. Yeah. And it's an inner kind of joy that comes from delighting in other people's good fortune and success, in the goodness in the world, in the happiness, in the reasons we have to celebrate and to feel uplifted in life, because there are many of those. But it also has the extra sort of characteristic of being an antidote to um, envy, to jealousy, you could even say to discontent, to a feeling of miserliness, you know, not wanting to be particularly happy for others because we don't feel we have yet enough. So it can help us overcome these um, kind of defilements in the mind which are based on aversion, right, based on ill will. And as such, of course, when we overcome those defilements at the root, then that mudita has a chance to take even more strongly into the mind. It has a chance to really grow and flourish in the mind. So it's a real win-win situation. And my teacher Ajahn Brown calls it kind of free happiness because you don't have to be having a great life, but there's always someone else who is. <laughs> or at least who seems to be, especially if you go on social media, everybody seems to be smiling and happy all the time. <laughs> people always say to me, oh, it's great to see you, you're always smiling. And I had to say, well, yeah, because when people take my picture, I'm smiling at someone, but I don't smile to myself all day. <laughs> But it's great, you know, because we can harness the happiness that's in the world and make it our own, as it were. And that's the beauty of these Brahma Viharas. We practice to all as to ourself, whether it's your happiness or my happiness. Let's share it, you know, because our common happiness is, is what we're really interested in in the Buddha's path. And it's interesting to talk about happiness. I know that in Buddhist practice we talk a lot about suffering. And um, classically, you know, we can understand the essence of Buddhism and the Buddha's teaching as the Four Noble Truths, which are all about suffering, the cause, uh, the way to end that, and the path to end that, yeah? The fact that there is an end and then the path to end that. But you could equally see it as a teaching on happiness and the cause of happiness, right? The causes of that and how to develop and further that happiness. 
And in a sense, the Buddha's teaching in the suttas, especially in the gradual training, which is mentioned at least 40 times throughout the Pali texts, is all about a kind of refinement of what we call wholesome happiness, niramisa sukha. So there are two kinds of happiness. There's the happiness that's based on sensuality, the sense pleasures, even just the objects of the senses. And it's not necessarily evil or wrong, but it's not a sustaining sort of happiness that wells up from within. It's something that's still very dependent on the sensory input that we receive. And as such, it's not reliable. It's not a reliable source of constant, unshakable joy. Whereas the happiness that he asked us to pursue was a very different kind of happiness. He said that there is a happiness to pursue, to cultivate, and not to be feared. And that is the happiness of the mind. And so with the practice of mudita, we're actually starting to turn uh, toward a different source of happiness that comes from within. It becomes like a wellspring of joy that we can tap into, you know, any time, just by inclining our mind in a certain direction. And that is not to negate the fact that there's incredible suffering in the world. You know? I read something recently, I think it was a, a TED Talk, somebody who'd studied resilience, and they said that one of the characteristics of resilient people is that they do, don't diminish the negativity, the, the suffering, the stress in the world, but they know how to tune into the goodness. And this is what makes them resilient. And in that way, you can see how mudita and karuna, compassion, are very good complements to each other. Yeah. And yet, most of the time, I think, we tend to practice with metta and with compassion. And compassion tends to, you know, empathize, resonate with, and tune into the suffering in the world. And then, in a sense, you could say that compassion is love's response to that suffering. It's what happens when love meets suffering. It's how it feels and how it responds. And similarly, mudita is, in a way, how love meets and responds and feels when it encounters happiness and joy, success and celebration. Mm -hmm. So they're all aspects of love, but if we focus too much on the compassion, it can lead to a kind of overwhelm and a sort of brooding, melancholic, sort of, if we're not careful, a, a sort of burnout, especially if we actually move more into empathetic distress. True practice of compassion shouldn't lead to burnout because we're focusing on the freedom of suffering. You know, may, may beings be free from suffering, free from pain. But still, you know, it can be a little bit more heavy. And mudita just has this lightness and buoyancy that can really counter that and bring a sense of, yeah, perspective on the suffering in the world. Because there's always going to be plenty of that. And yet at the same time, a lot of happiness coexists. It's just a matter of how we direct our mind, and I think this is where it gets really interesting, because sometimes people say, well, surely these perceptions aren't really true, right? I mean, you can, you can sort of reflect on happiness and gladness and all the things that are going well in my life, but that's not the real truth, that's not the full picture. But then I'd also like to say that, um, what is the full picture? What is the truth? Because as long as we have what we call the five hindrances operating in our mind, yeah, I, I'm guessing most of you know those five hindrances. So like craving, aversion, um, sloth and torpor, a very old-fashioned way of saying tiredness and sluggishness, um, restlessness and worry or remorse, and doubt. As long as those five are infiltrating our awareness, we're not able to see things as they really are. And so why not harness this ability we have with our perception, which is malleable, why not use that in a way that engenders beautiful qualities in the heart and that leads to the wholesome states both arising and also increasing? Mm. So we start to become wise to the way of the mind, to the way of perception, and also to the way of thought. So we can start to learn to channel our thoughts in certain directions, in positive ways. So that's just a little bit of background on, on mudita, but what I really wanted to focus on a bit more today is developing mudita towards ourself, looking at our own goodness, looking at the, our blessings that we have in our lives. All of us have plenty. You know, the fact that we could turn up here today, that shows that you have enough health. It shows you have the time 
and you've chosen to use this time in a really productive way for something that is evidently, by the fact that you're here, of great value to you, you know. You've chosen to incline the mind towards the Dhamma because you understand that as a refuge from suffering in this world, as a path that you can cultivate and that leads to ever-increasing peace. You've understood that, and that is your wisdom. You know, you might not feel that you're a very wise person. You might look around and think everyone else has been practicing longer than me. But you know, the fact that you came here today shows that you had a very good intention and chose skillfully from the options that were available to you about how you wish to use your time. So that's something we're ready to be very glad about and to rejoice about. And it's not to um, cultivate like a, a sense of aren't I great? <laughs> Just before this talk, actually, um, my dad phoned kind of spontaneously and uh, I thought, oh no, you know, I need to get my head clear to give a talk. But um, I kind of know how it works. Your mind tells you all sorts of things you don't have to believe. So I said, oh, actually, Dad, I was just about to give this talk about, you know, your own goodness and reflecting on your goodness. What do you think about that? And he thought about it for a second and uh, he said, oh, yeah. You know, we should just give ourselves a chance. We should just give ourselves a chance. I thought, oh, that's great, because I wouldn't necessarily choose those words, but I thought, isn't that lovely? You know, to become our own advocates in a way to give ourselves an equal chance in the way that we give others a chance too. You know, not just to focus on the faults and the lack and the low self-esteem or low sense of self-worth, but to look at the things that are working in our lives, look at the things we can really feel not proud in, a, in an egotistical way, but happy and gladdened about. You know, our kindness, our charity, our wish to be of service to others, or wish to support our friends, all these things I'm sure all of you have. You know, I know many of you are actually supporting me already and have been to my talks and, you know, some of you are actually feeding me with beautiful vegetable boxes like every month. <laughs> and that gives me just so much gladness and I hope it gives it to you as well because, you know, this is how we really share the joy in our hearts with others. And so it's really not um, about, you know, me being a great person. It's more about looking at cause and effect. How does it feel when I'm kind? How does kindness feel as an embodied experience? You know, what is the motivation that leads me to do something kind? How does it feel when it arises in the mind? How does it feel afterwards when I reflect on that? You know, can I feel um, uplifted by that? Can I allow myself to just dwell there for a moment and notice that, yeah, it took some courage or it took some restraint or some generosity to be kind. Sometimes it's so easy to say the wrong thing or just to be uncharitable towards someone, but for that moment that you were able to restrain yourself, you know, and even just abstain from saying something unkind, that's already something to celebrate. We don't have to be perfect to feel that we're good enough. Yeah, it's this lack of self-worth that's at the root of so many of our problems. And when we start to be able to appreciate our goodness, appreciate what we have going for us in our life, and not only appreciate, but even feel a sense of gratitude, even celebration towards those little things in our lives, then our life starts to change and we condition our mind to pick that up, you know, throughout the day. So Ajahn Brown's philosophy of life, which I wrote down because I thought it was so simple that I wanted to share it. He simply says, have fun with what you're doing. Put joy into your life that gives you energy. And then don't ask for much in life so that whatever you get is a bonus. And this is really lovely, isn't it? Because it gives you that sense of agency, you know. Whatever you have to do, you can do it with a frown or you can do it with a lightness. You can put joy into it. You don't have to feel like, what's it going to give to me? You can actually decide to make it work. Yeah, Just put joy into it, and that gives you energy. And this is one of the reasons that mudita can be such a beautiful reflection, because by reflecting on our goodness at the start of a meditation, we actually bring some energy into the mind. And of course, energy and mindfulness go hand in hand, right? The more energised we are, the more awake, the more aware... And as that mindfulness increases, the energy starts to come into the mind and translates again into more happiness, right? Depression is a very um, deflated, unenergetic, tired sort of state of mind. 
I don't know about people here, but um, I wouldn't say I'm subject to deep depression, but I do get down from time to time. You know, I would say I get depression from time to time, but what I've noticed is that it's much more likely to happen when I'm tired, when I'm exhausted. And, and often, for me, because it's mild, you know, I can just rest and recuperate, re-energise my mind, you know, and, and most of the problem just dissolves. Of course, if you have actual clinical depression, there's nothing wrong with taking medication just to get that sense of balance again, and that can be encouraged. But also, we can help ourselves by learning to use our mind, direct our mind wisely towards where our goodness truly lies, where our happiness truly lies. And not be afraid of that happiness that's based on goodness, that's based on virtue. So, of course, throughout the Buddha's teachings, he talks about virtue, and this is the foundation for the rest of the path. But one of the teachings that's not so well known is that he says we should reflect on our virtue. It's called Chaganu Sati in Pali. Chaga means like generosity or giving. And Chaga is actually one of the third noble truths, one of the ways of letting go. So it's actually part of the path out of suffering. Yeah? If craving is the cause of suffering, then letting go, generosity, giving up, giving away, freeing, is the way to overcome that craving and to lead to freedom and liberation. So this Chagaunu Sati is very beautiful. I remember one of my bikini friends in Perth, I was doing quite a lot of service in the monastery, and she said to me, oh, you know, when you go back after the day... Um, do you meditate or what do you do? I said, oh, I'm just quite tired. She said, oh, well, why don't you meditate and think about all the good things you've done and the way you've helped me? I said, oh, yeah, that's right. I don't usually do that. And she just looked at me and said, really? What a waste. What a waste. (laughs) And it really struck me because there's so much more we can get out of these acts. And when the Buddha talks about generosity, for example, you know, actually giving something to another, he says that... um, The purest form of giving is the giving that is done to beautify the mind. Such beautiful language, not to beautify the mind. And he also says that um, we should be aware of our intention before we give, during the giving, and also after the giving. And not only aware of our intention, but I would also go further and say, how does it feel in an embodied way? How does it feel, you know, at the physical level, in your cells? (laughs) How does your body, how does your mind respond? And notice that, bring it up in your mind, because you're conditioning yourself to do good again and again. You know, it's like if you're always thinking in a certain way about the faults, then you'll wake up in the morning and notice the faults in your partner, in yourself, in the mirror, whatever it is, you know, in the housework that hasn't been done. But if you condition your mind to look for the good, to look for the beautiful, then that's what you'll notice straight away. And and it'll become a habit, it'll become a pattern. And it almost has like a snowball effect. So I know I'm not supposed to speak too long today because um, we want to do some practice. But just to quickly put it in context (laughs) of the path, I would just like to encourage you to see this joy, especially the development that can happen through reflecting on our own goodness, as very much integral to the path from the very beginning right through to the end. And it starts, as I said, with the sila, with the virtue, and reflecting on our goodness, on our kindness, on our beautiful deeds. We can reflect on, you know, having companions on the path, people to practice with, the people who've come here today, or maybe you have people in your life, you know, who you consider spiritual friends. And there are places in the suttas where, you know, monks would be living together and the Buddha came and asked them, how's your practice going? And they basically said, oh, our practice is great. And he said, well, how do you practice mindfulness? And they said, well, we look at each other with kindly eyes and if and we act as though we're three in body but one in mind. So whatever this monk wants to do, I think, okay, why don't I give up what I want to do and help him? And then they further said, they sit down and reflect. They say, what a great gain it is for me, what a great gain to have such noble, virtuous, wonderfully kind, compassionate companions in the holy life. So they would sit down daily and reflect in this way about their spiritual friends. And that caused a foundation, not only of harmony and support, but a foundation of joy in their mind. You know, purifying their mind at the mental level, mental conduct, mental sila, if you like, that would then lead to the deep meditation. 
So from that sila, you know, we establish this purity in our lives, we learn to use our perceptions, our attention in a wise way, giving people the benefit of the doubt rather than assuming them to be at fault or, you know, to have had that bad intention that you're sure you can see, right? <laughs> we can never see another's intention. So we give them the benefit of the doubt. And then with this kind of um, training of the mind, it becomes easy when we sit down to meditate to establish mindfulness. Yeah? And as that mindfulness develops, we start to overcome these five hindrances and be able to access deep states of calm, which the Buddha calls samadhi, uh, samadhi states. And they can be light samadhi states, deeper samadhi states, all the way to the jhanas, which are very, very deep states of um, absorption where the five hindrances are fully overcome for that period of time. And it's when those five hindrances have been overcome through the jhanas, through the practice of deep meditation, that we then have a chance to really see things as they truly are. Yeah? The Buddha said again and again, samadhi pachya yata bhuta jnana dasana. It means samadhi is the cause for seeing things as they truly are. And what did he say was the cause for samadhi? Happiness. Sukha is the cause for samadhi, the proximate cause. So by developing this happiness, you see how it can take us all the way from the beginning of the path right through to the end. So this is my reflection. And I would have shared more sutta quotes, but there's just not enough time. So <laughs> you can, I'm sure, explore the suttas for yourself and also practice maybe some of these um, little suggestions today. So I wanted to share a guided meditation now with everybody. So if you need to gently shift your body, have a stretch, readjust your legs, find a comfier seat, Please do, out of compassion for yourself. So it's important in meditation to really take that care in the beginning, to establish a comfortable posture where you're actually being guided by what your body is asking you to do rather than pushing your body around like a slave. There's no special posture or high-speed posture to enlightenment. You can meditate in any position, wherever we are, as long as you're not driving. <laughs> And with your eyes closed, you'll be coming in contact with your body. Now that one of the sense doors is closed off, it's as though your inner eye is waking up. And you can start sensing into the feelings in the body. Noticing the feedback that your body is giving you. Invariably, I notice that my ankles are slightly squished into the shin. And that just giving them a little bit more space brings more ease, more comfort to my legs, ankles and shins. If you're sitting on a chair, you might notice that perhaps your feet are underneath your knees. It might be more comfortable to put them just slightly forward from the knee to relieve any strain on that joint. Perhaps noticing if you're holding your legs too closely together, maybe there's tension there. You could just relax and allow them to Drop slightly to the side. Checking your balance on your buttocks, whether anything's pinching, compressed. And 
noticing your lower back, your tummy. Perhaps just very gently stretching through the lower back to give your tummy and the organs there a little bit more space. Not holding that stretch, but again, just relaxing back. Very subtle, almost micro movement. Noticing your shoulders, your chest. I always like to roll my shoulders back. Reminding them that there is space. They can take up as much space as they like. And if you do reposition your shoulders, it might change the position of your hands. So checking in with your arms, your hands. Where are they most comfortable? Noticing your neck, checking whether it's bent to one side or the other. Inviting it to just slightly lengthen. So your posture is alert but relaxed. Gently scanning through the facial features, the areas we hold a lot of tension in our brow, our temples, our jaw. Now we're going to just spread our awareness, an awareness that's infused with kindness through the body at your own speed, as though basking each and every part of your body in the warmth and the light of the sun. So wherever the light of the sun goes, the mindfulness, the warmth follows along with it, the kindness. Taking time to really appreciate your body. giving it the time and the space to soften and relax. Without making any demands, just receiving whatever sensations you encounter on the way.
noticing the effect of this kindfulness, this loving awareness on those sensations. Relaxing deeply as though you were sitting in a beautiful garden. The warm sun on your back soaking through each and every cell. Not needing to be anyone, prove anything or get anywhere at all. Just enjoying arriving and staying in the here and now. If you wish, you can continue to bask in this beautiful kindfulness, just hanging out. Otherwise, I'd like to invite you in a little reflection. Just bringing to mind some quality that you can really appreciate and value in yourself. It may be your kindness. Your honesty. your courage, perhaps 
a willingness to make mistakes. Whatever it is that you can notice and appreciate as a noble quality and allow the recollection of that to uplift your heart. give you confidence that your life is on the right track it could be something more specific such as your intention your good and wise intention in turning up today despite the pressures of family life despite the worries deadlines or so many other things you could have done. You chose to take steps in the Dhamma because you recognize the value of the Buddha's teachings in your life. This is truly something to rejoice in, to feel glad about, to celebrate in your life. Noticing any subtle happiness, joy, softening of the heart. See if you can allow that in. No matter how humble, how modest it may be. be contented and easily satisfied.
the mind becomes quieter, subtler, more and more receptive. You might also notice the breath. Another beautiful gift that the Buddha gave us a path to walk on this all the way to liberation. The breath comes into your mind. See if you can welcome it with gratitude without trying to possess or control or capture that breath. But just allow the breath to calm and gladden the mind. If your mind's not ready for the breath, that's fine too. Just appreciating this moment, whatever arises. With a mind that's contented and easily satisfied.
coming close to the end of this meditation. Just notice how you feel now. Noticing any uplift. Any peace? Any joy in your heart? However humble. Just tuning into that. How does your body feel? I'd like to end with a few wishes, phrases of mudita, of joy towards ourselves. If you wish, you can put your hand on the heart or just connect with the heart area. And gently receive these phrases. May I rejoice in my inner goodness. May I recognize appreciate and celebrate whatever happiness, lightness or peace is in my heart. May I not be parted from the blessings in my life. And may my joy, peace and wisdom increase. beings who I meet and all those beings who I may never meet, may they all share the goodness of my life. As you open your eyes, if you can stay connected, part of the mind can stay inside in that quiet place.
here <laughs> seem to go far too fast for me. <laughs> Hopefully there are some little tools and tips that you can, um, what's the word, tailor to your own needs from time to time. It can be a nice way to just get a little bit of energy up in the beginning. Yeah. You can go straight into that actually, but I, I always like to meet the body first and get that sense of embodiment. And also the body and the sensations in the body can be a really... Um, nice field to practice our kindfulness on. You know, this idea that mindfulness goes hand in hand with kindness. We can really know that by the effect that awareness has in our body. We can know whether we're being kind or whether we're being demanding and aversive or grasping, you know, pushing things away. So I like to start with a quick body scan. But normally, yes, each one of those parts of the practice could be a whole session, really. You've got a condensed, condensed little practice today. <laughs> Good, so I'm going to open for any comments, feedback, questions or complaints that anyone might have. And it's all equally valid and equally welcome. I say that, I have to live up to my word now. <laughs> but I know you're all very kind. Yes, patience and forgiveness will be the theme. I've not done that theme before, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> patience and forgiveness, in a sense that we can develop more in our lives, but also how we can practice those particular uh, attitudes and perceptions in our practice, in our meditation. Being patient with our old mind, our old breath. <laughs> and forgiving the moment because it is a product of whatever went before <laughs>